Thanks so much for joining us today. God wants to do so much for you and through you, and we'd love to hear about it. Take a moment to send your story to stories at parkerhill.org. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by going to parkerhill.org give and choose the giving option that works best for you. Well, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. Well, happy Easter, everybody. Great to have you with us today across all of our Parker Hill locations. And uh, so good to be joining together with over 2 billion people around the world this weekend who are celebrating Easter, celebrating the greatest hope that history has ever seen. Let me just uh, speak to the kids uh, at all of our campuses as I begin today. Uh, You can go ahead and take that bag back out that you received as you came in today. And I'm going to be talking for just a little while here. But as I do, whenever you see an egg come up on the screen, just find that same colored egg inside that bag and open it up and uh, you can interact with what's inside of it. In fact, you can go ahead and find the, the green one inside your bag right now. There's a little snack in there that you do not have to share with your parents. And you can take that out and you can begin eating that right now. So this Easter, Easter 2018, I just want to focus today on one word, and that is the word hope. Hope is an incredibly powerful force in our lives. Hope is one of the strongest motivations in the human heart. Uh, Hope is why we go on blind dates. Hope is why we buy treadmills. Hope is why we have children. Hope is why people will buy a lottery ticket for the mega millions, even though the chances of winning are less than your chances of being hit by lightning twice. Hope is a very powerful force. And Easter, Easter is all about hope and not a lottery ticket kind of hope. I'm talking about real hope, life-changing hope, the kind of hope that can wash away your shame and regret the kind of hope that can heal your pain and sustain you through the darkest times of life, that's the kind of hope that we're talking about and celebrating today. So uh, as we talk about hope, I want to draw your attention to this box I have up here on the stage with me today. Uh, Years ago, many young ladies would have a box like this, oftentimes uh, in their bedroom, and they would put things in here like china and linens and heirlooms that they wanted to pass on to their children, and they would put those objects in this box in anticipation of the day when they would have a family of their own. Do you remember what this kind of box is called? What's it called? It's called a hope chest. That's right, because inside it are objects that represent her greatest hopes and dreams. And uh, this isn't very common anymore, and that's probably a good thing. But I got to thinking that we all have one of these. We all have a place or places where we put our hope. So the question I want you to ask yourself today is this, where is your hope? Or maybe to phrase it a little bit differently, is your hope in the right box? And there are so many things that we tend to put our hope in. I'll give you some examples. Uh, You might, when you were growing up, you might have had one of these right here. Remember the sound that this would make? You know, for some people, that sound, that becomes very addicting, and they grow up thinking, you know what? My hope is going to be in my finances, and if I can just make enough, and if I can just earn enough, then all my worries will be gone, and I'm going to be secure. But some of you, if you're honest with yourselves, would admit that you have more than you've ever had, but it's still not enough, and you fight more, and you drink more, And you worry more than you ever have. And you're beginning to wonder, did I put my hope in the right box? Maybe uh, you can remember a time when you got one of these. And you brought this home and you put it up on a shelf, maybe in your bedroom. Maybe it was a trophy that you got for some kind of athletic competition or a dance recital or some uh, some kind of academic achievement. And you remember how good it felt to get that award, and so you decided maybe early in life that I'm going to put my hope in the box of achievement, and so you got the education, you got the job, you climbed the ladder, but then you woke up one day, and you realized that there was still an emptiness inside, and you began to wonder, maybe I put my hope in the wrong box. You know, a lot of people put hope in their physical health and physical strength, and they spend a lot of time trying to stay healthy and keep in shape. And that's a very good thing. That's a very important thing. But then what happens is the doctor calls one day and says there's something wrong in your body, and it's serious. 
And at that moment, we remember how frail, how fragile, how temporary our bodies are. And we say to ourselves, you know what? Maybe I put too much hope in the wrong box. Do you remember the first time that somebody really cared about you? Somebody paid attention to you. Somebody said they wanted you. You know how good that felt. And so maybe you decided, you know what, I'm going to put my hope in the box of relationships. And so you started looking for just that right person, and you just kept finding the, the wrong right person. And now you've been through some busted relationships and maybe a couple of marriages, and you're wondering, did I put my hope in the right box? So where, where's your hope today? You know, maybe you come into this Easter with a little bit of sadness in your heart, maybe a lot of sadness, maybe some frustration, but maybe if you could trace that all the way back, you could trace it back to the fact that you've been putting your hope in all the wrong things. Today, I want to show you the story of two followers of Jesus on that first Easter who lost hope, who, who had hope, but then they wondered if maybe they put their hope in the wrong box. Their story is told in Luke chapter 24. Luke is one of the four gospels, the four biographies of the life of Jesus. And let me set the scene for you. Here's how it starts in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That same day would be Sunday, that first Easter Sunday. And there were two of these Uh, believers, two followers of Jesus, they were headed home to the village where they lived called Emmaus. They had been in Jerusalem. They were there when Jesus was arrested and beaten and crucified on a cross, and now they were were heartbroken, and their hope was gone. And so they, they figure they have nothing left to do but to go home and go back to what is familiar because their hope has been nailed to a cross. It has died. And so they're making this seven mile journey back home. And I want to talk about their journey today. I want to talk about your journey as well. So let's go on a seven mile journey together. Lace up your shoes, stretch out your hamstrings. And as we take this journey with these two people, I want you to think about your journey and where you are spiritually today. Let me divide this journey into three sections. First of all, the first part of the journey, hope lost. Hope lost. Here's how it goes. Verse 14. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, this is so fascinating. They're walking down the road, and Jesus kind of slides up next to them and begins a conversation with them, but it says they were kept from recognizing him. And that's one of those things you read in the Bible, and you just scratch your head, and you say, what is that all about? Here's what I think was happening here. I believe that Jesus needed some time to talk to them. He wanted to help them make sense of the terrible events of the past few days. He needed to give them perspective on everything that had been happening. But in order to convey that information, he needed their full attention. So think about it. How much were they going to pay attention to his words if they realized it was him? So they were supernaturally kept from recognizing him. It's like an April Fool's joke on Easter. I think April 1st fell on Easter that year too. So here's how the conversation goes. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. You can see the hopelessness even in their body language. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? Like what planet are you from? Did you just crawl out from under a rock? And if he had said that, Jesus would have said, yes, in fact, I did. But here's what he actually says, verse 19. What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth. This is so funny. This is funny. They're talking to Jesus about Jesus, but they don't know it's Jesus. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the words of hope there, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And I think they said this almost in a whisper. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We had hoped. Those three words describe the depth of their disappointment. We had hoped, but now we wonder if we put our hope in the right place. I wonder how many millions of people over the years have uttered those three words. We had hoped. 
We had hoped that the cancer was in remission. We had hoped that our marriage was going to last. We had hoped that we would be able to have children someday. We had hoped that we would be able to save our house. We had hoped that the business would succeed. We had hoped that our child would get his life together and get off drugs. I mean, we had hoped, but now we wonder if we put our hope in the right box. Listen to what they were hoping for. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, I have to give you a little bit of a history lesson here for you to understand this. At this point in history, the nation of Israel was part of the vast Roman Empire. The people of Israel had been living under the iron fist of the Romans now for about 70 years. They hated the oppressive Roman taxation. They hated having Roman soldiers in their streets abusing their people. And so when it says here they had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, that's what this means. It means they were saying, we had hoped that this man who could work miracles, we had hoped that this man who was the son of God, we had hoped that he would overthrow the Romans, give us back our freedom, and restore the glory of God's people. We had hoped But here's the problem. They were putting their hope in the wrong box because Jesus had not come to create a political kingdom in one location. He had come to create a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of all people across the entire world and throughout history. And in order to establish that kingdom, he would have to die first and then leave behind an empty tomb. And because they didn't understand this, they had put their hope in the wrong thing. And, you know, we live in a world today, we live in a culture today where there's so much anxiety and so much hopelessness and people turning to all kinds of things to escape from it. But I think the greatest source of our frustration and our despair is the problem and the tendency that we have of putting our hope in the wrong things. And maybe that's where you are in this part of the journey as you come to Easter 2018. Maybe you've lost hope. And let me just say this, that's not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes all of our hope has to be stripped away. All of our hope in the stuff of this world that is so temporary has to be stripped away so we will look at the true hope. See, I used to think that disappointment was the opposite of hope. I don't believe that anymore. Now I think that disappointment is simply a doorway to a deeper hope. And when these two followers of Jesus lost hope, he began to point them to a better hope. And that's the second part of this journey. The next part of the journey, I would call this hope rising. Okay, so you've got these two very discouraged guys. They're on this seven-mile journey. They don't realize it yet, but Jesus is walking right alongside them. And as they walk together and as they talk together, the resurrected Savior begins to resurrect their hope. Here's what happens, verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ, and the word Christ means Messiah, did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In other words, he's saying, you're missing some important pieces here. The suffering had to come before the glory. The cross had to come before the crown. And then he goes on to do this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is so fascinating. So as they're walking down this road, and seven miles would be about a two-hour walk. So buckle in. We're going to be here a while, folks. No, they're walking down the road, and Jesus is walking them through the Jewish scriptures and connecting these writings that spanned centuries to himself so that they could understand that he was the promised Messiah, that the suffering had to precede the glory. He was helping them to fill in the missing pieces and to get clarity and get a better kind of hope. Do you know what's so interesting to me? We can be close to something. We can be familiar with something. And yet, even though we're close to it and familiar with it, we don't fully understand it. All the married people know what I'm talking about, right? But let's not talk about marriage. Let's talk about a dollar bill, right? Like, so you use a dollar bill all the time. You see them all the time. You handle them all the time. And if I were to ask you some basic information, like which president is on the dollar bill, I think all of us could say, well, that's George Washington. But even though we're so close to dollar bills and and, and so familiar with them, There are some things about them, some details that we never really notice. Like if you flip this over on the back, there's this one symbol on the right side in the back, and it's it's an eagle. And in his left 
talon, there are 13 arrows representing the 13 original colonies. And in the right talon, there's an olive branch. And the symbolism behind that was that we need to be a nation that always leads with peace because the right hand is the dominant hand. And we want to lead with peace, but we always want to be strong enough to defend our sovereignty if we need to. Fascinating symbol. And then the other side of the dollar bill, there's this funny-looking pyramid thing with 13 steps to represent the original 13 colonies, but an unfinished pyramid because they believed that the nation was only in its infancy. And that funky-looking eye was a symbol to them of God's providence, that he would be watching over this nation. And the Roman numerals at the bottom, 1776, the year of the nation's birth. Now, if I had quizzed you, you probably would not have known any of those details. But we, we interact with dollar bills all the time, and yet we, we don't really fully understand them. And that's like these guys on the road. They had been so close to Jesus, so familiar with him, but they didn't really understand his calling and what he had come to accomplish and how it would all unfold. Maybe this is where you are on your spiritual journey. Maybe you're at the point where you're kind of familiar with faith, you're kind of familiar with the Bible, you've gotten close to it, like maybe you have some vague memories from a confirmation class or Sunday school, but you don't really understand the deeper meaning of it all, and therefore you don't have a solid hope because you don't have solid answers. I think you owe it to yourself to take some time and ask the questions and understand the reason why so many of us live with this kind of hope and the answers that we find there. There's a really simple way that we offer that you can do this. It's a class called Starting Point. starts next Sunday, and it's just a a group discussion where you can ask your questions about God and faith in the Bible. If you've been away from church for a long time, you're brand new to church. If you're in that part of the journey where hope is starting to rise up, and you had enough hope to walk in the doors of a church, but you've got a lot of things that are unanswered, it jump into starting point next week. You can ask uh, all your questions there. So let me, let me show you the last part of this seven-mile journey. I'm going to call it hope found. Hope is found. Verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, that was Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. Like there was no Motel 6 in those days. So here's what's happening. They get to the end of their journey. They get to their hometown. They come to this point of decision. They could have decided, you know, as their hearts were being stirred, as something was happening inside of them, they could have decided, you know what, that's enough. You go your way, we'll go our way. We're going home, going to go to bed But they didn't do that. They decided they wanted to know more. They invited Jesus into their home so that they could discover more of these answers. They just didn't know who it was at the time. And again, think about your own journey. Maybe you've come to this point where you have this sense that God is stirring up something in your heart, that God is drawing you to himself. And eventually you come to this decision point in your journey where you have to decide, am I just going to let God go his way and I'm going to go my way? Or am I going to open up my life, open up my heart, and invite him in to be the forgiver and the leader of my life? You know, I was reading this, and I couldn't help but think about a verse much later in the Bible. It's in the book of Revelation in chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me, and eating in that culture was a sign of very close friendship and fellowship. And my, uh, my grandparents, who were very, very godly people, um, they, had, they had a picture that hung on the wall of their living room, and it was, a, a, it was a picture that was based on that verse from Revelation. And I remember one time my dad pointed something out to me, and uh, I, I don't know if you would even notice it, but there's one very important detail in this picture. There's no doorknob on the outside of the door. And the reason why the artist painted the picture this way is because he wanted to make a point. And the point was this, that God will not break down the door of your heart. That he will knock, he will prompt you, he will speak to you, but ultimately you've got to open the door and allow him in. You've got to allow Christ into your heart because he will give you your space. If you want to keep him at a distance, he will allow you to stay at a distance both now and forever. And so they come to the end of this journey, 
and they open up their home, they invite this stranger in. They don't know who this stranger is yet. And here's, here's what happens next. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. So fascinating to me that after they invited him in, that's when they recognized him. When, when they opened the door, that's when God opened their eyes. That's when the pieces of the puzzle all came together. See, there's something that happens when you open your heart to the Savior and you invite him in to be the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sins. That's when it really becomes real to you. That's when, that's when Jesus is no longer just a figure from history, just a name in a theology book. That's when you have this sense that you don't walk alone in this world and that you are the son or the daughter of God. And so hope has been restored, but now it's a whole different kind of hope. And here's where this hope leads them. This is how the story ends here. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11, that would be the 11 remaining disciples besides Judas, and those with them assembled together. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So, so here's what happens. They've got, just finished this seven-mile journey home. Their hope is renewed. And you know what they do? They get back on the road and they make that same seven-mile journey back, even though it was probably dark at this time, even though they were tired from the journey home, even though it could have waited until the next day. This hope was so strong that it compelled them to go all the way back to Jerusalem. And then, driven by that hope, they began a movement that would eventually change the course of history and change the hearts of billions of people, including my own. And those first century Christians, they were persecuted and many of them put to death by the Roman government. They were fed to lions in the Colosseum. They were burned at the stake. And you know what? They never lost hope again. They did not turn from their faith. They kept their eyes fixed on eternity. And you know what's interesting to me, that the, the Christians in the first and second centuries, they had a symbol for their hope. And the most common symbol of their hope in the first and second centuries wasn't actually the cross. The most common symbol was this one, an anchor. It comes from Hebrews chapter 6, which says this, we have this hope, and it's describing the hope that we have because of the, the death and resurrection of Christ. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. In fact, many of the graves of Christians in the first and second centuries would have not, not a cross inscribed on it because crosses were still in use, and crucifixion was so gruesome they didn't want to be associated with it. But oftentimes there would be an anchor this is a, a, the grave of a Christian in the catacombs in the city of Rome dating back to the first century. Because as it says in Hebrews 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. And I love this symbol of our hope because here's the thing about an anchor. In order for an anchor to work, it has to be hooked into something at a distance from you, underwater, in a place that's unseen. And the hope that we need is not a hope that's anchored in anything around us, anything in this world. We need to have a hope that's anchored in something eternal, something greater, anchored in the one who came into this world, went to a cross, and left behind an empty tomb. And here's the other thing about an anchor. It doesn't mean the storms will never come in your life. It just means that when your life is battered by the storms, you won't go under because you have hope as an anchor. There was a movie that came out like 20 years ago, uh, Julia Roberts' movie. I never saw it. Uh, I think my wife watched it a time or two. But the movie was entitled Hope Floats. And I always thought, that's a rather strange title for a movie. Don't even know where the title came from. Don't even, never even saw the movie. But I thought, that's very strange, Hope Floats. Because real hope, authentic float, or authentic hope, it doesn't float on the surface of your life. It goes down beneath the circumstances of your life. It digs into something much deeper, and it holds you when all hell is breaking loose in your life. And that's what we celebrate at Easter, a hope that's greater than any circumstances you may face, a hope that is greater than even death itself. And I don't know what brought you here today. I don't know why you're in church on Easter. 
Maybe you're here to keep your mama happy. Maybe you're here to keep your wife happy. Maybe you just think it's the thing to do on Easter. Maybe somebody promised you a meal afterwards and this was part of the deal. I don't know what brought you here. But I know why God has you here today. Because we all need hope. We can't survive without it. And I believe that God wants to give you a hope that's greater than any of the stuff in this world that we tend to put our hope in. But you've got to accept that hope. You've got to open up the door. You've got to grab the rope at the end of that anchor. And we'd love to talk to you at any point about what it means to have that hope and embrace that Savior. But for now, uh, as we wrap up, I just want you to hear some stories because there are so many people in this church who've traveled the same road that these two people traveled People whose hope was lost, and then their hope began to rise up again, and eventually they found a hope that changed everything. And we want you to hear some of their stories. So watch this with me. I gave up on life. I gave up on everything. And the one thing I've done my whole life was try to control my destiny. And I've never felt good inside. Instead of turning to each other, we turned on each other. (laughs) I just couldn't understand how it could get better. Uh, My life was, uh, it was very chaotic. I seemed to always be missing something and I didn't obviously know what. I was constantly beating myself up over the decisions that I had made and constantly revisiting memories that caused me pain. I have felt far from God. The depression and the overwhelming aspects of the disability, there are moments that I really am aware of what God is doing, and then there are other times where I'm not. People who care deeply about me said, you need to go to church. You need to find your way. As I stood in the church service, I I just teared up at the end and says, I need to do this, I need to do this today. All came out was, I wanna follow Jesus first in my life. I have a relationship with Jesus, and it's unconditional. My life became more peaceful. You know, that chaos was gone. Every morning I pray, let them see you in me. I want people to look at me and say, what is with you? (laughs) The Holy Spirit, that's what's with me. (laughs) God is with me. He has promised that he will never forsake us, even when The only thing I can see is the disability and the pain and the weakness. I know that he is still here and he's not let go. We just think of Jesus as that strong core that holds us together when we feel like we're completely unraveling. Just hit me. Life is just so much better with God in it. I have three daughters, so I have to show them what a God-fearing man is. Show them how to love through how I treat my wife. So I am their template. I need God, and it has to be part of our family, and it has to be the sole provider of who I look to. I pulled and pulled and walked away, and he just never left. He was that solid rock. He never let you go, even though you're trying to pull away. Jesus has transformed my life. You can be redeemed, and that redemption is real. And I want people to feel how I feel.